Okay, hello one and all. So in our previous lessons, we've been looking at some of the different erosional features that we might find along our coastline. We looked at the formation of headlands, the formation of bays, but we also spent a significant amount of time being able to go through the process of sequencing our answers to be able to explain how a headland erodes. And we looked at the formation from a cave to an arch to a stack to a stump. What we're going to do today is we're going to flip it a little bit. We're not going to look at the formation of erosive uh, features we're going to start to look at processes of deposition so without further ado i'm just going to present my screen to you guys just so that you can see what our aims are for today's session what our success criteria is and what we're aiming to achieve by the time we get to the end of it so i'm just going to go over to my slide deck here and you will see that we have got this particular title which says the formation of beaches and sand dunes. Now there's going to be one question that you're going to be tackling over the course of this lesson. That question is this target question here which I'm just circling with my mouse cursor and it says use figure C to sequence the formation of sand dunes and again you'll notice that I've put that word in bold and I've put it in red because it's really important that we are sequencing answers and sequencing responses. You're probably getting bored of me going on about it but to be honest I just don't care because it's about making sure that you've got the skills that you're going to need by the time you get to GCSE. So essentially our success criteria for today looks like this. It says apply and sequence keywords in order to explain the formation of beaches and sand dunes. OK, now you guys can't see figure C just yet because it's a bit small, but that will become a little bit clearer to us as we start to move on through today's lesson. OK, and our two key features that I put again in bold and in red are beaches and sand dunes. Now, the first part of this really, to be honest, is to start looking at the formation of beaches. Now, the first question that I'm going to ask you is a really, really simple one. At least it sounds simple on the face of it. And the question is, what is a beach? So if you're working on Google Documents and submitting via Google Classroom, what I'd like you to do is to just open up a document now um, and to um, just start by jotting down your own definition of what you think a beach is. Um, for those of you that are perhaps working on paper, just have a go and see if you can do it. You've got a rather lovely picture of a beach in front of you in fact this is one of the most fabulous beaches that i've visited and i'll talk to you a little bit more about this particular beach in a moment but for now two minute time is going up there see if you can write down what a beach is perhaps more difficult than you think finished your definition of a, a beach have a little read through it just just check it have a look at the picture remind yourself of what a beach is OK, then, guys, right, your time is up and it's ticked to zero. Now, I've done this exact same exercise with some friends and family. And obviously, I've taught over the years a lot about beaches. And these are some of the really common responses that I get. 
And actually, I think you will have found that it's actually more difficult to be able to define what a beach is than you think. So I hear things like a piece of sand or pebbles near the sea, something you visit on holiday. Not a particularly geographical answer to the question. OK, but I guess it's still true. A place to relax. I've got an environment between the land and the ocean, something which is formed by the waves near the land and sea. OK, so actually it's a really, really difficult thing for us to be able to define. Now, you might have a definition which is along similar lines to some of those definitions that are up there in front of you on this screen. OK, but I'm going to share with you my definition. And this is my definition. My definition is a gently sloping piece of land between the high and low tide mark. OK, now, obviously, I'm an absolute geek. So whenever I'm going to the seaside with my family or going with friends, I'm not going to the beach. I'm going to that gently sloping piece of land between the high and low tide mark. OK, so it's embedded in my brain. So next time you go to the beach or someone asks you if you want to go to the beach, correct them. Tell them that you go into a gently sloping piece of land between the high and low tide mark. Now, to put that simply, let's have a look more at the definition that comes from the textbook. And it says here, beaches are deposits of sand and shingle. And that's really critical. There is a difference between different types of beaches, which I'll show you on some images in a minute at the coast. Sandy beaches are found in sheltered bays. Waves entering the bay are constructive and have a strong swash to build up the beach. And I said that right at the beginning of this session. I said that it was all about features of deposition. And we looked at wave types quite some time ago. And we said that those constructive waves have strong swashes and because they have a strong swash they bring beach materials such as sand and pebbles up onto the land and that's what creates and that's what forms our beach okay and look at it it is a gently sloping piece of land down towards the sea between the high tide mark which might be somewhere around where my cursor is here and the low tide mark which might be further out to sea through there now, there are different types of beach, and I think that's really important that we have a look at it. Now, I mentioned that this was one of my favourite beaches that I've ever visited down here in the bottom right hand side. It looks like it could be somewhere in the middle of the Caribbean. You've got beautiful, crystal clear blue water, turquoise water, and you've got that lovely sandy beach. It is, in fact, in the north, north of Scotland, in the Outer Hebrides. It's a place called Uig Sands in the Isle of Lewis. Um, another, perhaps maybe not so glamorous looking beach, is uh, what, another one that's important to me, is South Sea Beach in Portsmouth. This is where I went to university so I spent quite a lot of time running along the promenade and um, going down on the beach with friends with barbecues and all sorts of different things like that but what you can see there is we've got two very different beach types you've got a shingle beach and here you've got a nice sandy beach which you can see down there and I'm sure that many of you that have visited the seaside have been to both variations of different beach now there are a number of factors that kind of impact on what type of beach we get so I've put here what determines the type of beach well there are, there are probably two factors really Firstly, the geology of any nearby cliffs, because let's face it, how does the beach material get there? Well, it's eroded from a cliff somewhere and it's been transported and it's been broken down by processes such as attrition and it's been deposited on the beach. So the geology of the nearby cliffs may determine what type of beach you get. From my experience, if you go down to Walton on Nays on the Essex coast, you've got red crag and you've got clay which comes out of the cliffs, which gives us sort of that, that more sort of sandy effect in our beach. If I was to go somewhere else where we've got a different rock type, perhaps maybe where we've got limestone and chalk, we might tend to find that we've got those larger pebbles. Now, there's another factor that comes into play here, and it's the energy of the coastline. Now, I gave you the example of South Sea in Portsmouth. That's on the south coast, and the south coast is generally a high energy coastline, which means that it gets more destructive waves. So what that means is that the small sand particles get washed away, which leaves behind those larger particles, which form those more shingles type beaches. Now, I've got a two minute timer down here in the bottom right hand side. I'm going to click play on this. And what I would like you guys to do is to just jot down a little title which says what determines is the type of beach and just see if you can break down those two bullet points which you've got in front of you.
Okay, one minute to go, guys. Remember, if you think you're going to need more time, all you need to do is just pause the video. Okay, then guys, clock's ticking, less than 10 seconds to go. Superb stuff. Okay, so we know what a beach is, and we know we've got different types of beach. Now, some of you might be looking forward into the future, and you might be thinking that A-level geography is something that you're interested in. Now, as part of our A-level course, we study coasts. Obviously, we do it at a slightly higher level to what we would expect at GCSE, but that doesn't mean you can't push yourself. So if you want to go that little bit further, pause this slide and have a little look and see if you can find out about berms. See if you can find out about storm beaches and barrier beaches, and see if you can do a little bit of independent research on something which is called a sediment cell. There's a link down here which you can use, which takes you to a fantastic website, which has got loads of A-level geography notes, which are created by a former geography teacher um, uh, and colleague called Andy Day. What I want us to do now, though, is I want us to start focusing on the formation of a feature which is called sand dunes. Now, hopefully you guys, by the time we get to this video, will be able to explain figure B, which is in front of you. Before we do that, though, what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on this link and it's going to take us over to a video clip from the Time for Geography videos, which we've used before in the past. They're absolutely fantastic as a resource. Um, and let's see if we can find out a little bit about how sand dunes form, okay? Now, actually, before we go to the video, it might be worth just making sure that everyone knows exactly what a sand dune looks like. If I go back to that first slide, there's quite a small image here, but you can see a coastal sand dune there starting to form, okay? So let's go to our time for geography video, um, and let's see what we can find out about how these sand dunes form. Point National Nature Reserve on the northwest corner of the Wash in Lincolnshire. It's incredible to think that this entire landscape has formed as a result of deposition in just a few hundred years. Gibraltar Point lies at the southern end of a sediment cell that stretches from here all the way to Flamborough Head, 116 kilometres to the north. A sediment cell is a stretch of coastline in which sediment can move around but sediment rarely enters or leaves the area of that cell. And that's one of those things which you can look into if you want to take your thinking further to push it up to an A-level standard. Crucial thing that she said there in the video is that this is a feature which is formed by deposition, so when material is being dropped by the, the power of constructive waves. Much of the Lincolnshire coastline has receded by between 400 and 800 metres over the last 500 years. The Holderness coast to the north of Gibraltar Point is the fastest receding coastline in all of Europe. Much of the sediment that's eroded up at the Holderness coast is transported south by longshore drift and it's deposited right here where the orientation of the coastline changes creating the sheltered environment of Gibraltar Point. All this deposition has created a five square kilometre area of land comprising of a well-developed ridge and runnel foreshore, sand dunes and salt marshes. Twice a day, the tide moves across this beach by up to seven metres on the highest spring tides. At low water, you can see exposed a very large beach, a wide beach, and also offshore some large sandbanks. The wide beach that we can see here and the offshore banks show us just how much sediment deposition is taking place here at Gibraltar Point. 
This beach is a very important source of sediment for dune development. The sand is picked up by the wind and bounced across the beach surface by a process known as saltation. Okay, so this is our first stage and it's quite windy in the video, so you can see this happening. The wind picks up the sand from the foreshore and it starts to bounce it along and it's called saltation. Easy to remember, really, because when we've looked at rivers, we've looked at how material is moved in rivers and bouncing material is saltation as part of that process. That sediment that's been carried up the beach by saltation starts to get deposited around here, just above the high water mark, and this is where sand dune development begins. In the first stage of sand dune formation, the wind comes into contact with an obstacle like this driftwood, a rock, a shell, or even some litter. The wind slows down, deposits its sand, and it starts to build up against these obstacles. Okay, so you get obstacles on the beach. He's given you two examples there, driftwood, or it could be a rock. The sand hits against that barrier and it can't get any further and then over time the sand starts to build up now these are the first sand dunes that we see closest to the sea and we call them embryo dunes so when we start talking about embryos we're starting to talk perhaps maybe about life in its early stages and that's an easy way of remembering it these are the sand dunes in their early stages these are the embryo dunes that are being formed this spiky little plant is prickly salt water and it's a pioneer species on this sand dune which is helping to build up and stabilize the sand in which it's growing okay so he's talked about prickly salt wart there are other uh, plants i tend to think of marron grass and what that grass does is it grows with really really deep roots and because it's got really deep roots it binds that sand together and it stabilizes the sand dune so where you get vegetation like these these bits of marron grass which you can see here Okay, you get the sand dune starting to build up and as it gets bigger, we start to move backwards and we get different types of dunes. We get what we call yellow dunes um, and as we start to move further back, we get those back dunes which are, which are full of lots of different pieces of vegetation. Most plants would die in this environment, but the prickly salt wart, with the help of its waxy leaves and deep roots, are able to get the nutrients that it needs out of this sandy soil and salt water environment. The prickly salt water is helping to stabilize the sand on the sand dune here. And also it acts as a shield that slows down more wind, causing more sand to be deposited on the sand dune to grow. These small, delicate sand dunes are called embryo dunes that are right next to the beach. And they're the youngest sand dunes that we get along this coastline. These embryo dunes here have probably formed in the last few months or so. Just inland from the embryo dune is this fore dune where sand is really starting to accumulate. We have these salt tolerant vegetation species like sand cooch grass and lime grass, and they're really starting to take hold. Just beyond the fore dune, this first main ridge of dunes are called yellow dunes. These yellow dunes have been here for 30 or 40 years, so they're really well established in terms of vegetation. Marum grass is really common on yellow dunes. So as you can see, the further you move back down the, down the succession or through the sand dune, you get more and more vegetation. And that's because those dunes are more established. They're also more sheltered as well from the effects of the salt and the effects of the wind and the effects of the wave, which means that more vegetation can grow. And this stuff is really good at stabilizing the dune and trapping sand. These dunes are called yellow dunes because of the sand that they're made of, which gives them a yellow color. But as we start to go inland, this all starts to change. Further from the coast, the dunes are more protected from the inundation of seawater. And so we start to see more and more vegetation. And what's more, that vegetation is changing. Whereas before we had a lot of salt tolerant species like marum grass, here it's not as salty. And so more species are able to grow like this sea buckthorn and perennial species like dewberry, which we have here. We 
call these grey dunes, and you can see why when you look at the colour of the soil. So this is a sample of sand that we collected from the yellow dune, which is much closer to the shore, and you can see just how yellow that is, in comparison to this sample, which we've collected from the grey dune. And you can see that in this grey dune, there's much more organic matter than humus. And if you compare the two samples side by side, you can really see the contrast in colour between the yellow dune and the grey dune. OK, right. I'm going to pause that video there. I'm just going to flick back to our slide deck um, just so that we can just have a little bit of a recap, really, on what we've seen in terms of that video. Now, I've got a nice diagram which I've taken direct from the textbook, and this shows the sand dune formation as you move from the foreshore, which is the area which is closest to the ocean or closest to the sea, to the backshore to the dunes. OK, and we can see here that we've got those embryo dunes, which are those first dunes that start to form with just small pieces of, of different pieces of grass and vegetation. Then we get our four dunes, where we've got more vegetation building, our yellow dunes, which you saw there, which are even more established with vegetation, and our grey dunes. Okay, And this shows us the cross-section of how those sand dunes form. Now, the other thing that it's worth being aware of is something which we call a dune slack. Now, the dune slack is just the wind which blows these big depressions or dips in the sand dune. And they're our slack. So if I have a look at this diagram, here's the dune, here's the slack. Here's the dune, here's the slack. OK, so you can just see how those dunes start to oscillate and how they start to move. Now, this is broken down for you in the textbook from this figure here, which is figure C. Now, I'm not going to guide you through this, but if you pause it, you'll have an opportunity to be able to read through each of those different sections. So what I'd like you to do is to pause the video now and just read through that flow diagram on your own. OK, now hopefully you've had an opportunity to pause it and to read through it. I'm going to show you my sequence of steps, OK, because it's really important that we get into the habit, as I've said time and time again, of being able to sequence how these different things form as a series of step by step. So step one I've put there, the wind blows sand up the beach, and this is called saltation. So remember, the wind blows it up and our pebbles jump, OK, and we call that saltation. Step two, the sand gets caught behind an obstacle such as a piece of driftwood or a rock. Step three, as more sand gets trapped, it forms the first dunes. We call these embryo dunes. Okay, and you can see that I've put the keywords in red and in bold as we go through. These can become stabilised, which means prevents the dunes from blowing away by the roots of vegetation such as marron grass. These larger dunes, called four dunes and yellow dunes, form. In time, rotting vegetation makes the sand dunes more fertile and the range of plants can grow in the less exposed back dunes okay, or grey dunes, if you wanted to use the terminology from the video. The wind can blow depressions or dips in the sand dunes. These are called dune slacks. So what I've done is I've sequenced a series of steps, step one through to seven, and each of those steps guide us through each part of the formation of the sand dune as we move from the foreshore all the way back here OK, as we move inland past those grey dunes, which you've just seen in the video. Now, in terms of what we need to do for this question, you needed to be able to use figure C to sequence the steps and formations of a sand dune. Now, I've pretty much given you a model answer to that question. And I say this all the time. What's the point in telling you what you need to do without showing you what success looks like? So success with this question looks like my seven point sequence of steps. So what I'd like you guys to do now as your final task as part of this lesson is to push pause at this video on this particular slide that we've got here. Look at the question, read back through the figure, which is those series of sequence steps. Think about what I've just guided you through. And remember, you can rewind the video if you want to find out a little bit more and write your own sequence of steps to be able to explain the formation of a sand dune and how it changes from the foreshore all the way back there to those grey dunes right at the end. OK, pause this video and give that question a go. OK, well done, everyone. Hopefully you've had an opportunity to do that question. Remember, you can rewind the video. You can go back. You can pause things. You can go back over things. OK, and if there's anything that you're still unsure of, get onto Google. There's loads of resources out there that will support you and help you with GCSE geography. And don't forget that A-level resource if you want to take things that little bit further. Okay, that's it for today. 
enjoy. Next lesson, what we'll do is we'll start to take our thinking forward a little bit and we'll probably look at how we can start to defend the coast. So we're going to start to look at different types of engineering.